there. It's a pleasure to welcome you and David Frack to this event today. David is a good and long-standing friend, and that's really why I wanted to just make a pre-introduction. I will leave it to Danny to tell you more about him. Um, but I was thinking about this today when I was thinking about making this introduction. I was thinking about the first time that I met David Frack, and we were talking about some Guantanamo cases in D.C., and he was very calm. You know, I'd ask him some questions. Well, we might do this, we might do that, and I thought, you're awfully calm about all this. And since that time, I've realized that he's, he calmly goes about being a brilliant lawyer and a wonderful friend, a staggering presence in the courtroom, and in all in all, um, wonderful, wonderful person to know. And I think that you will have a wonderful time today listening to uh, some of his thoughts about Guantanamo and other things. Welcome to you, and Danny will tell you more about David Frack. Thanks, Professor Morrison. Thanks, all of you, for coming here. And uh, Professor Morris runs the Guantanamo Clinic, so if you're interested in that, you should talk to her. Um, it's glad to have you both here today. Uh, Colonel Fracht, um, I worked with him, actually met him at MacDill Air Force Base this past summer. Um, he was working there. Uh, and uh, so I'll tell you a little about him. Uh, he graduated from Harvard Law School in 1994, uh, spent 10 years on active duty with the United States Air Force, JAG Corps. And uh, then transitioned, he's uh, now and since then uh, been a member of the Air Force Reserve and is a law professor. Um, he teaches and is an expert in fields of criminal law, criminal procedure, international law, uh, war crimes, and humanitarian law. Um, he's frequently quoted in national media, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, um, all the big publications. Um, and a couple fun facts, uh, he's actually an, quite an athlete, he was the finalist in the European Armed Forces Tennis Championship and uh, was on his College Bowl trivia team. Um, another interesting fact, um, well, one of the things he's going to mainly kind of talk about today, I think, is from his 2008 to 2009 was the lead defense counsel with the Office of Military Commissions. And so that experience um, is going to kind of inform a lot of what he talks about today. And uh, he's also working on a capital case right now. So maybe we can hear a little bit about that. Um, so without any further ado, Lieutenant Colonel Fratt. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, and uh, hopefully my mics are all on. And it is a pleasure to be back here at Duke Law School. I've, I've spoken here a few times. Um, and it's, thank you for your very kind words, Madeline. And Madeline is a dear friend, and, and you would all be very lucky to have her as a professor if you get the chance. Um, and I certainly encourage you to, uh, to check out the Guantanamo Defense Clinic if that's something you're interested in. Uh, I worked with uh, some of your students directly here when I was um, on active duty defending detainees at Guantanamo, and, and they made an important contribution to the case, and I think they got some value out of it. Um, and I, I know that, that uh, although you, you never get the chance to meet the clients, um, unlike other uh, clinics that you may have here. Uh, it, it's a very high profile, very interesting kind of work. Um, so um, let me just, since it's a fairly small group, I want to get a sense of, and I see we have one. Uh, are you in the reserves? Active duty? ROTC. ROTC. OK, we've got one ROTC student. Um, how many people? consider themselves to be close followers of the Guantanamo Military Commissions? OK. One and a, and a half. All right, so um, <laughs> who, who's a close follower? Right there, we got, we got two semi-close followers. All right, so I just wanted to see what the sort of background level of, of uh, knowledge, because it's frankly, it's not something that people follow very closely. It's not something that most Americans know about. Even law students um, have only a very sketchy awareness of what goes on there. So uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of, of historical context um, that will help place my Guantanamo experience um, in, in context, all right? Uh, I did, as uh, Danny described, I did uh, serve as a lead defense counsel um, in 2008, 2009. Um, 
I represented two detainees, one by the name of Mohammed Jawad um, and another by the name of Ali Hamza al-Balul. Um, and the New York Times described the Mohammed Jawad case and his situation as being, quote, emblematic of everything that is wrong with Guantanamo. Um, and I think that description could also be used to describe Mr. al-Balul's case. Um, certainly together, the two cases represent just about everything that is wrong with Guantanamo and the military commission. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about these cases, but first let, let me put them in context a little bit. To do that, we need to go back to September 11th, 2001. And I guess many of you may have been in, I don't know, junior high or something at the time. Um, <laughs> I know, hard to believe there's a couple, a couple of us are a little older, but, but you know, that was a, a seminal event, uh, certainly for people who were in the US military. Um, for all of us, it, it changed life as we know it in the United States. Um, but I want to go back, I want to focus on what, what was the law at the time? What was the state of the law at the time um, with respect to terrorism and, and, and war crimes and such? Um, at the time of 9-11, military commissions were authorized. The president was authorized to establish military commissions. However, those military commissions had to follow the rules and procedures of courts martial. They had to be essentially the same as the uh, military justice system that we have for our own soldiers. That was the state of the law. Um, and if we capture a, someone and treat them as a prisoner of war, they are also, they are entitled, if they're going to be tried for war crimes or offenses of, uh, uh, under the law of war, they're entitled to be tried under the Uniform Code of Military Justice in a court martial. So basically, that was the options that the Bush administration had. The third option would have been federal court, which of course is where we always had tried terrorism, uh, you know, terrorism cases before, including the prior attempts to bomb uh, the World Trade Center okay, that had, had failed, but had killed a significant number of people and caused a lot of damage. So, um, but the Bush, th these options did not suit the purposes of the Bush administration. Um, in my view, the military commissions are really a kind of a fiction that are designed to hide their real purpose or, or at least the real purpose that they had at their inception. Um, what P President Bush conceived, or the way the military commission, and when I say President Bush, I'm not sure that he ever actually had any idea in his head about this, but whoever was advising him and came, coming up with this stuff, um, what they were thinking was, we need a place where we can try suspected terrorists, where they could be sentenced to death without any semblance of due process based on evidence derived from highly coercive interrogation techniques up to and including physical and psychological torture. Already in the fall of 2001, President Bush had authorized the CIA to detain, capture and detain, to in, in secret and interrogate using um, totally illegal methods. Um, and so there was a, an instant recognition that if we do this, we're not going to be able to put these people on trial in a regular courtroom, because that kind of evidence is not admissible in a regular American courtroom, including a military trial. So, but we have to put these guys on trial. I mean, we've promised. Right? That's, whenever there's a terrorist attack, what's the first thing that do, the president does? He says, we're going to follow you to the ends of the earth, we're going to capture, capture you, and you are going to face justice. We're going to put you on trial. All right. So there was a recognition that it has to be a trial, but it can't be a traditional American trial. 
because of what they were planning to do with these people or what they had already started to do with these people. Um, so, but of course, you know, they couldn't say that, right? They couldn't say, well, we plan to torture people and then put them on trial in a, in a kangaroo court, right? They couldn't say that, um, even though that really was exactly what they were planning on doing. Um, so they came up with a, a marketing strategy, if you will, of marketing the military commissions as, um, as something that was consistent with uh, an American historical tradition of having military commissions. And it is true. We have had military commissions. We had them in the Civil War. We had, I mean, Abraham Lincoln's assassinate, uh, you know, assassins were tried or co-conspirators. Uh, we had them... Um, a couple of these trials in World War II with German saboteurs. Uh, we had them in, in the, you know, some Indian wars, you know, uh, against the Seminoles and, and places like... So, you know, there, there is a tradition there, and, and they tried to fit this concept of military commissions as being within that tradition, and there was a claim that, that the military was uniquely suited to try war crimes. And that there was this claim that 9-11 that itself was a war crime, right? Not a terrorism crime. That they, they would, you would hear this all the time. These aren't ordinary criminals. These are war criminals. All right. um, so we're going to have these war crimes tribunals which, uh, where we can put unlawful alien enemy combatants and try them for their violations of the law of war. And so this is a war crimes tribunal. The problem was that of the thousands of, the, of persons that we detained, including a total of 779 that were sent to Guantanamo or detained there at some point or another, there was only a handful, at the very most a handful, that had engaged in any conduct that could legitimately be characterized as a violation of the law of war. But we, the, the Bush administration had to justify why they were holding all these people at Guantanamo and, and telling everyone that they were the worst of the worst and treating them terribly. Um, even though, of course, you know, the initial pictures of... of of detainees and dog cages and all that. That only lasted for a couple months, and they put them in, in nicer facilities after that. But that was the image that people had. And clearly, you know, we were not treating them very well. We were claiming that they had no legal rights at all, uh, that, that Guantanamo was a legal black hole where you weren't entitled to be told for the reason that you were being held. You weren't entitled to challenge it in any way. No access to courts, no access to lawyers. So. To justify that, it was felt that they needed to put a bunch of people on trial. They, there needed to be a significant number of people, not just the 9-11 guys, but there needed to be a significant number of people that were put on trial um, to show that there was a, a, a valid reason for holding all these people, that they really were war criminals. Um, so in order to get to a significant number of people that they could try, uh, it was necessary to tweak the law, shall we say, to uh, increase the pool of people who could be prosecuted, who could be subject to military commissions. Now, President Bush announced military commissions in November of 2001. Right? He said, we're gonna do, this is what we're going to do. We're going to try people in military commissions. So the first... Um, round, if you will, of military commissions were a, uh, military tribunals that were created by executive order. Right? There was no, because the statute that authorized them, he didn't follow that. He just created this thing by executive order. Right? So we're, and now we need to expand the scope of people that can be tried under this executive order. So how are we going to do that? Um, how, do you, how do you increase the the numbers. Well, first, the temporal scope of the war was expanded. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, 
the law of war, sometimes called law of armed conflict, LOAC, or, or IHL, international humanitarian law, it's all the same thing, only applies during periods of armed conflict. Okay? It's a specialized law that applies, a lex specialis, that applies during periods of armed conflict. It doesn't have to be a declared war, but it has to be an armed conflict. Okay? Um, now, when do you think the war started against Al-Qaeda? What would you say? OK, day we invaded Afghanistan, you're talking about? OK, that's reasonable. Anybody else have another thought of when, when the war started? Cold bombing. Mm, interesting. <coughs> when was the cold bombing? Do you know? Uh, 2000. 2000, OK. Maybe the 93 World Trade Center attacks. Ooh. <laughs> So you think we were in a state of armed conflict from 1993 to 2001? I mean, <coughs> your whole childhood? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I was three at the time, but uh, yeah. So, so from the time you were three until now, we've been in a state of armed conflict. United States. There was no peacetime, and in the, in the 90s wasn't peacetime. I mean, it all depends on how you define armed conflict. Ah, okay, that's exactly true. Anyone else? When do you think, ma'am? When do you think the war started? From the time we. Um armed Osama bin Laden from the time we uh, gave arms to the Mujahideen. But were we, was the United States in a state of armed conflict? I mean, that may have been the roots of cause of the later conflict, right? I mean, we did train Mujahideen, right? Well, we did arm bin Laden back when the Afghans were fighting the Russians. So that's a very interesting point. But I don't think we would, Many people would say we were in a state of armed conflict. We were told that we were not there, but we do not know. Okay, so we might have been, that was a kind of a proxy conflict, perhaps, mm -hmm. against the Russians. All right, I'll buy that. Um, but that did end. I mean, the Afghanistan conflict ended, and then it restarted later. So there would have been some kind of break in there. Anybody else? When do you think the current war against... Uh, Al-Qaeda started? Um, I might agree with when we invaded Afghanistan. OK. Anybody think it started on 9-11? OK, see a couple hands for 9-11. How about when Congress authorized the use of military force, which was like a day later? I mean, those to me, those would be the plausible starting points. I will tell you that as a member of, of active duty military, that I certainly was not under the impression that I was in an armed conflict in, I, I went in in 95. From 95 until 9-11, I had no idea we were in a state of armed conflict. No one ever mentioned that. Um, there were no, you know, because when you're in a state of armed conflict, you're given rules of engagement, you declare a force to be hostile. None of that had ever happened until 9-11. So, um, and if you look at back at the coal attack, if you look at the attacks on, uh, I mean, yes, 9-11 was not the first Al-Qaeda terrorist attack on the United States. That's clear. Prior World Trade Center bombing, it's arguable whether that was really Al-Qaeda because that was kind of pre-Al-Qaeda, but um, they were like-minded jihadists. Um, but bombing of Nairobi and, and Tanzania um, embassies, that was Al-Qaeda. Bombing of the USS Cole and Yemen, that was Al-Qaeda. So, but at the time of those attacks, they were characterized by, among others, our president as cowardly peacetime terrorist attacks, attacks on, you know, U.S. targets going about their peaceful daily mission, completely unwarranted, unjustified. There was never ever any mention of war in a state of armed conflict. But what we have now done, or what the, we, that is the U.S. government, is now trying to do is expand the scope of the conflict retroactively and recharacterize what previously was described and thought of as peacetime as us being in a state of armed conflict. And, and no one takes it quite back to 93, but they do take it back to 96, when Osama bin Laden declared jihad against 
in the United States. They say that was that's the starting point. Since then, we've been in a state of armed conflict. We didn't really realize it, but we really were. Okay, and so by doing that, it enables the military commissions to potentially have jurisdiction because the subject matter is the war against Al Qaeda, kind of, and um, it only applies when when the armed conflict is in a, is ongoing. So they can go back and say, yeah, USS Cole bombing, that was during a state of armed conflict. Bombing of the embassies in Africa, that was during a state of uh, armed conflict. Law, law of armed conflict applies. Those are war crimes. So that's one way that they expanded the scope, expanding the temporal scope of the war. Another way would by, by expanding the geographic scope of the conflict. Now, when we think back to 9-11, the, the, the prevailing wisdom was we were attacked by al-Qaeda, which had been granted safe haven by the Taliban in Afghanistan. Right? They were allowing them to operate there freely, have their training camps and so forth. And we asked the head of the Taliban to turn these people over. He refused. We said, if you refuse, we're going to invade your country. He refused, so we invaded Afghanistan. Right? So the war initially was seemed like a war against <laughs> Afghanistan. But they quickly adopted the nomenclature of a global <laughs> war on terror. And so wherever al-Qaeda or al-Qaeda offshoots or affiliated groups were found, pretty much any kind of Islamic fundamentalist terrorists, we would say that's part of this war. That's part of this conflict. So that, by doing that, that enabled us to fold in events worldwide, including bombings in Bali, Indonesia, of uh, a nightclub and of, of the Marriott, a JW Marriott Hotel, and clearly, you know, those were terrorist attacks and civilians died. But we, we had no military presence in those areas. Um, but we said, no, that's part of the war. That's part of the global war on terror. So if we capture those people, they're subject to military commissions. The third attempt to expand the, the pool, if you will, um, was simply to broaden the concept of war crimes to encompass the very act of fighting. Basically, the position of the United States was, we can fight you, but you can't fight us. If we can try to kill you, but if you try to fight back, that's a war crime. Because you're not allowed to fight. You're not allowed to fight because you are not in uniform, you're not part of a state military. Right? You don't follow the laws of war. Um, you don't wear distinctive insignia. Uh, you don't follow a chain of command, even though maybe they did. But that's what we said. No one that we were fighting in the global war of terror was allowed to fight back. There were no lawful combatants on the other side. If you try to destroy U.S. Proper, military property, attack U.S. military soldiers, kill U.S. military soldiers or coalition soldiers, that was a war crime, according to the United States. Now, nobody else in the international community bought this at all. Um, the idea that the status of being a civilian and engaging in hostilities was a war crime. Because the US was conflating a couple different concepts. One was the concept of combatant immunity, where if you are a lawful combatant, if you are a member of a <coughs> national armed force or one of the other categories defined in the Geneva Conventions, you are entitled to fight, and, and you cannot be prosecuted for even for killing the enemy 
because you have combatant immunity, and if you're captured, you're entitled to be treated as a prisoner of war. We said, now, it is true that if you don't meet the, all the categories or, or the definitions of the Geneva Convention, you're not entitled to be treated as a prisoner of war. But it's, we took it one step further to say, <clears throat> not only are you not entitled to be a prisoner of war, but you are a war criminal and can be prosecuted for um, even reconnaissance, even, you know, engaging in, in planning, uh, even joining al-Qaeda. Reconnaissance we called spying. All right. um, joining al-Qaeda we called furnishing material support to terrorism. You provided yourself to al-Qaeda, and that's material support to terrorism. Um, so we, add, we made up a whole bunch of crimes, war, new war crimes that didn't exist, that were not recognized. I mean, law of war is an international law. Right? And there's a number of treaties that set out uh, what the list of recognized international war crimes are, most notably the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. But we, there are other sources as well. None of them recognize this concept. Um, so fighting us becomes a war crime. Fourth way of expanding the pool was simply to take terrorism crimes and recharacterize them as war crimes. So the crime of terrorism itself, providing material support, cons and conspiracy to commit terrorist acts, we all relabeled as war crimes. Now, the amazing thing about this, this really incredible, breathtaking, unprecedented attempt to expand and, and, and change the law of war and to expand this pool of defendants is that it, it didn't really yield many defendants um, for the military commissions. Now, let's think about this for a moment. If it is a crime, a war crime, to fight against the US or its allies or to offer one services to al-Qaeda, or be a member of al-Qaeda, then shouldn't everyone that we detained have been prosecutable in the military commissions? I mean, if you look at the justification for detaining people at Guantanamo, and the, the law, the, the legal definition of who we were lawfully permitted to detain, uh, it was alien unlawful enemy combatants. And that was defined as people who were members of al-Qaeda or affiliated groups, or people who in, had engaged in hostilities against the United States, hostilities being defined as fighting us. Okay. So everyone at Guantanamo was supposed to be one of those things. And therefore, everyone at Guantanamo should have been prosecutable in a military commission because those things were determined to be war crimes. <laughs> but in reality, the vast majority of the 779 people brought to Guantanamo had no business being there at all. Not only was there no evidence that they had engaged, I'm talking about the vast majority of them, in terrorism or war crimes, but in most cases, there was no evidence that they had even fought against the United States or its allies. Now, there were a number of low-level foot soldiers. There were some people who had attend, attended some jihadist training camps at one time or another. But actual terrorists were the exception, not the rule. And war criminals were even scarcer. So as probably you probably know, this, these original Bush military commissions that were created by executive order were invalidated by the Supreme Court in the summer of 2006 in a case called Hamden v. Rumsfeld. And what the Supreme Court said, well, this doesn't, these don't match the military commissions that were authorized by statute. So if you want to create military commissions like this, you need, or a, something different, you need statutory authorization. So President Bush went to Congress and asked them for statutory authorization, and they passed what they called the Military Commissions Act of 2006 became law in October 2006. And at that time, the chief prosecutor was a friend of mine, um, or be, 
strangely uh, became a friend of mine uh, over time, Colonel Morris Davis, Air Force Colonel. You might have seen he had an op-ed in the New York Times over the weekend. He's now become a very vocal, outspoken critic of the military commissions. But he was the chief prosecutor at the time, and he was a big cheerleader for them at the time. And what he was saying at the time is that we plan to try 75 to 80 of these people. You remember that, those days? OK. So that was about 10%. That's a respectable number. You know, 10% of the population of Guantanamo. Um, and so uh, they passed this law, and then they, the law required to have an a implementing regulation, because it was kind of a bare bones law. They needed an implementing regulation from the Secretary of Defense. Um, and so that came about in the spring of 2007. And then there was this enormous political pressure to get started with these military commissions. Because they had been stalled for several years by this challenge by Hamden that went all the way to the Supreme Court. So they said, we need to start charging people. We need to start charging people. So the first three people were charged in the spring of 2007. Um, and that was David Hicks, Salim Hamdan, Salim Hamdan, the guy who just won Hamdan v. Rumsfeld, was bin Laden's, Osama bin Laden's driver, his kind of chauffeur. Okay? Um, David Hicks was an Australian, kind of a soldier of fortune type guy who had gone to get some training and sort of joined the Taliban. And there wasn't any real evidence that he'd actually fought or did any terrorism, but, but he was there. And when we invaded Afghanistan, we captured him. And they're like, what is this white guy doing here? <laughs> <laughs> What's this English speaking, you know, that was unexpected. But so, but the Australians, like, you got to get our guy out of there. He doesn't belong there. He's a white guy. He's not, you know, I mean, come on. Um, he doesn't belong there with all those Arabs. So we're getting a lot. The, the Australian prime minister called Dick Cheney. said, we're getting a lot of pressure to bring him home. We're hearing bad things about the way people are being treated at Guantanamo. Can you please figure out a way to get him back here? And they said, sure, no problem. So they cut him a deal. They cut him a deal. So they plead to one count of material support to terrorism, and we'll give you a nine-month sentence and you can go back to Australia. Pretty good deal. Fastest way out of Guantanamo of, any, of anybody. So he took the deal. The next guy, Salim Hamdan, bin Laden's driver, he was put on trial for material support to terrorism, conspiracy, and I think that was it. But he was, he was acquitted of conspiracy, and he was, acquitted, and he was convicted of material support to terrorism. And the jury gave him five months. Well, it's not completely true. He, the jury said, will he get credit for the time that he's already spent in Guantanamo? And the judge said, yes, I'm going to give him um, 57 months of credit. And they said, OK, he gets 62 months. So they gave him five months more. Right? And then he was sent home to Yemen. And the third guy was Omar Khadr, a Canadian. And again, there was some pressure from Canada, not a whole lot. Um, but the thing about Omar Khadr is he was a kid. He was 14 when he was captured. And so the United States became the first country in the history of the world to attempt to prosecute a child soldier a juvenile as a war criminal. So those are the first three. And the next two, fourth and fifth, were my two clients. Mohammed Jawad, another teenager, this time from Afghanistan, and Ali Hamza al-Balul, a Yemeni who was, I'll tell you more about later, but he was a, a kind of a media advisor and personal secretary to Osama bin Laden. So he was definitely al-Qaeda. and part of bin Laden's inner circle, but not very high up and not an operational terrorist. Okay. Now, why do you think they would start the military commissions with these five people? I mean, I gave you a reason for the Australian, but why, 
Why these other four people? Why low-level foot soldiers, <coughs> child soldiers? You know, why not real terrorists? Anybody have any ideas? <laughs> why they would start with these five cases? You make the mistakes on the ones that don't matter. Pardon? <coughs> Sorry. Um, you make mistakes on the ones that matter less than... Okay, so this is a new system. It's untested. We've got to work the kinks out. We might as well start with some, some small cases, you know, and f figure it out. Anybody have any other ideas? Is that your... Somebody? Okay. So that's a big part of it. That was a big part of it. But there was another big part of it, and that had to do with classified materials. Um, the... The bigger cases, the 9-11, the Al-Nashiri, um, the Indonesia bombing, those defendants had been held by the CIA, and much of the evidence had been obtained by intelligence agencies. Right? And Colonel Morris Davis was committed to having open, transparent trials. He did not want to have trials that had a lot of closed sessions where classified evidence was presented. And so he had to work with these intelligence agencies to try to get the evidence in the first place, because they were intelligence agencies don't like to give things up, especially if they know they're going to be turned over to the defense, to defense attorney, right? Um, so get it was like pulling teeth getting that information from them. And then Colonel Davis wanted it to be declassified so they could use it in open court. And that was an incredibly laborious and slow process, and the, the intelligence agency, agencies were dragging their feet. So they, they said, well, on these low-level guys who are nobodies, who are not real al-Qaeda, you know, serious terrorists, there wasn't much classified evidence, if any. So that's why they were able to start with these folks. Um, in my in Mohammed Jawad's case, for example, there was virtually no classified evidence. We had one tiny uh, little bit of classified evidence, but you know the vast majority of it was unclassified. So, so they start off, and I um, now I was a critic of the or early critic, fairly early critic of the military commissions. Uh, I had got out of the military in two thousand. Five, or got off active duty, went in the reserves, and I became a law professor. And when you're a law professor, you've got to write law review articles. So I'm like, well, and somebody said, well, write about, if you're going to you know, write a law review article, write about something that really pisses you off. And one of the things that really pissed me off was military commissions and the way that we were treating detainees generally. Um, and the fact that we had abandoned the Geneva Conventions just annoyed me. It wasn't right. Um, the fact that because I knew that the JAGs had been consulted, and they had said, you should follow the Geneva Conventions, and you should treat these people as prisoners of war, and you should, if we're going to try them, try them in you know, courts martial or something like them. Um, but that's not the way that we went. Um, and back in 2006 and 2007, after this Military Commissions Act was passed, we heard a constant refrain from the Bush administration, which was, these military commissions are virtually identical to courts martial. It's virtually, they're getting almost exactly the same rights as our own soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen would get. They're 99% the same. So I decided to investigate that and see if that was really true. And I did, I actually went and did a line-by-line -line comparison of the Military Commissions Act and its implementing regulations with the UCMJ, and the Manual for Courts Martial. And guess what? They weren't the same. I like to say that, you know, sometimes you hear that uh, humans and rats share 99% of the DNA. Have you, anybody ever hear that? OK. But that 1%, that's the crucial, right? That's a very important 1%. It makes for a whole different animal. And so. Military commissions and courts martial were 99% the same in the same way that rats and humans are 99% the same. Okay. That it was a crucial 1% that was missing. Yes? Actually, it's chimps and humans. Who chimps are, and humans? Are 99%. Yeah, I think we're like, are, chimps yeah. are like 99.5 and rats, but they're up there, right? Well. It's, are you a biologist? 
Certainly. It's a high percentage, right? Okay, it's a perhaps imperfect analogy. But even chimps and humans, that's a big difference, right? Um, so, uh, they, they weren't the same. So I had wrote this article where I said, you know, these things are they're not fair, they're, they're um, heavily weighted toward the prosecution, would not pass international uh, rule of law standards, they're not regularly constituted courts under the Geneva Conventions. Um, and shortly after I published this article, the Department of Defense sent out a uh, department-wide solicitation to all reserve JAGs saying, hey, we're looking for prosecutors and defense counsel for the military commissions. Now, having just written this article saying what a terrible system it was, I didn't feel like I want to be a prosecutor in that system, but I thought, hey, you know, it might be fun to be a defense counsel and try to bring about some, some much needed change um, and highlight some of the injustices that are going on. So I volunteered and I was selected. And so the uh, chief defense counsel at the time said, how quick can you get out here? This was winter of 2008. I said, well, I'm teaching law. My, my class ends uh, August 27th. I can be out there, you know, like the next day. He said, great, I'll see you then. So I get there, um, August 20, or April 29th, I'm sorry, April 29th, 2008, and the chief defense counsel says, OK, um, get yourself on the next plane to Guantanamo, because I'm assigning you as lead counsel on two cases, and you have an arraignment in both cases next week. I'm like, what, what, what just happened? You know? uh, two cases? I'm like, OK, I'm lead counsel. Who, who else do I have? He said, nobody. You're it. You lead counsel, you're solo counsel. Um, I'm like, OK, you know, no problem. I can rise to that challenge. So I got on the next plane to Guantanamo. They actually gave me my own plane. It's pretty cool. Um, I, I had two translators, one um, Pashtun, Pashto translator for my Afghan client, and one Arabic translator for my Yemeni client. And we had our own plane, the three of us. They flew us down. Uh, we stopped at, uh, um, uh, what is that, West Palm Beach to refuel. And we were a private jet port went in. They had Starbucks coffee. I'm like, I can get used to this. You know, free <laughs> chocolate chip cookies. I never got a, my own plane again after that. But um, so I fly down there. And they said, you know, you have three days to establish an attorney-client relationship with your, with your clients and, and, and represent them in this arraignment. And so I made contact with Mohammed Jawad. This, now, Mohammed Jawad, at that time, was about 21 or so, 22 maybe. He had been captured when he was approximately 15. Uh, he was accused of throwing a hand grenade uh, at, that had injured two US uh, Special Forces soldiers and their interpreter, um, according to what I was told. Um, he had been arrested immediately on the, at the, on the scene. Uh, there were eyewitnesses who saw him throw the grenade. That He immediately confessed to the Afghan authorities, who then turned him over to the US, who, and he immediately confessed to the US authorities. And so it, it was a slam dunk. And you know, I kind of assumed that that was true. Because having been a military prosecutor and a military defense counsel, I mean, generally speaking, we didn't just go around charging people with things that they didn't do. And, um, and furthermore, they had six, they had him for six and a half years. Uh, you know, so like, well, they've had him for six years. They've had all this time to prepare this case. He's a juvenile, so it's very controversial to be charging him. It's one of the very first cases. Surely they wouldn't you know, charge him unless the case, charges were really solid, right? That's what I was thinking. So I initially focused on. Um, his status as a juvenile. Right? Say, so, well, you know, you, you can't try a juvenile, but actually, under the under the uh, Military Commissions Act, it turns out you can. Uh, there's really nothing to, to prevent it. Um, so, I'll get to. Well, I'll, I'll, let me tell you a little bit more about his case. Um, it turned out that there really were no eyewitnesses. I mean, there was a guy who said he was an eyewitness, who was a cop that had arrested him. But there were a whole bunch of other eyewitnesses who said, 
that cop was eating in this cafe at the time that, that, the, that the grenade went off. He didn't see anything. He finished his meal and went outside and just started arresting people right and left. And there were dozens of people that were arrested at the time. They just started arresting people. I mean, someone did throw a hand grenade into a US Jeep, and it did injure two US soldiers and their interpreter. But they really didn't know who. And a little bit of further investigation revealed that the interior minister of Afghanistan held a press conference the next morning and said, we have captured the three foreign terrorists who were responsible for yesterday's cowardly and dastardly grenade attack. And they've all given full confessions. Well, where were these three guys? Who were these three guys? My guy wasn't a foreign terrorist. He was an Afghan teenager. Where was the evidence? The prosecutor didn't even know about that. I found that out by a Google search. <laughs> I kid you not. I was trying to, I wondered, well, I wonder if there's any news accounts of this event, you know? Because I was told, well, this was the first attack on US soldiers in Kabul since the fall of Kabul. So I Googled it. Grenade attack, December uh, 17, 2002. Yeah, I got a whole bunch of stories, and one of them said, the yeah, interior minister held a press conference and said, we've captured the three foreign terrorists. The prosecutor didn't know about that. So I'm like, well, what about these confessions? What about the, I mean, he confessed, right? Well, it turned out the confession to the Afghan authorities, what they did was they wrote a confession for him, and then they told him, uh, this is your release paperwork. We need you to sign it. He said, I don't know how to sign. I, I, I'm, I'm illiterate. Well, put your thumbprint here. And then they gave that to the Americans and said, here's his confession. He signed it. So I had this Pashto interpreter. I said, hey, could you look at this confession for me? And I've been given a translation by the, by the prosecution, but I'd like to make sure that it's an accurate translation. You know, because the, the, the words really matter. You want to make sure it's a really good translation. He said, no, I can't translate it. What, what do you mean? You're a Pashto translator. He said, well, that's not in Pashto. I'm like, what language is it? He said, that's Dari. That's the other language we speak in Afghanistan. I'm like, well, does Mohammed speak Dari? He said, no, he's Pashtun. Oh, God. So this confession that was supposedly his handwritten confession was written in a language that he didn't speak, and he didn't read, and he didn't write. And by the way, they told him if he didn't confess, they were going to track down his mother and kill her, or a member of his family. They punched him in the nose, broke his nose. So the uh, American judge, the military judge, the military commission said that that statement was a product of torture and suppressed it. Now, what about this confession to the Americans? Because after a few hours in Afghan custody, he was turned over to the Americans. And they took him out to their forward operating base outside Kabul, and they, they interrogated him. Well, first, though, they stripped him naked, and they took a bunch of pictures of him naked. We're not supposed to do that. That's a violation of Geneva Conventions. And then they brought him in the interrogation room, and they started screaming at him in English. Because the Afghans told him, he's a foreign terrorist. He speaks English perfectly. And he's cowering in a corner. And finally, they had an interpreter. And he said, I don't think he really understands. So he starts yelling at him in Dari, because the confession was in Dari. He doesn't speak that either. So finally, he gets it right. He starts yelling at him in Pashto. And he's like, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I'm innocent. I had nothing to do with it. They, I was just there. They arrested me. I was boom. They're like, yeah, sure. We know you confessed. And so for the next several hours, they grilled him. They said, well, what we know. Now, the interesting thing is that the, the, the Afghan confession said, I acted solely on my own. I went to Kandahar. I purchased the hand grenades. I came to Afghanistan, to Kabul, because I don't like the way that the British are treating our women. And I said British, and so I threw the hand grenade at them, and I would do it again, and I'm proud of it. And the Americans said, well, we know that's probably not exactly what happened. We know somebody put you up to this. Um, 
probably you were recruited by some unscrupulous terrorist group, and they promised you work, and and uh, you know, so you reluctantly went along with it. Maybe they even drugged you. And he's like, um, okay, yeah, yeah, that's what happened. So they wrote that up. Well, they didn't actually write it up. They videotaped the entire interrogation. So I said to my opposing counsel, hey, uh, could I get a copy of that videotape? Because I'd like to see you know, what he actually said and what they actually said. He said, no problem, except there was a problem. The videotape was gone. Prosecutor couldn't find it. There were multiple copies. We talked to the guy who videoed it. He said, yeah, I did video it. I went, I made two copies, I distributed them to the proper authorities, they were all gone. So we called up the interrogators who were there, who conducted the interrogation, said, hey, do you remember this? What happened there? Yeah, that was a long time ago. You know, I've interrogated so I really don't, I, I really don't remember any I remember he confessed, but that's all I remember. So that case fell apart. The judge found that the confession of the Americans was the product of torture derived from the earlier torture investigation, that there was no break in events. He threw it out. Well, what about the eyewitness? Well, as I told you, so I, I you know, there was this eyewitness, and I had a Marine major working for me. Always a good thing to have. So I said, hey, um, there's this witness over in Afghanistan. There's a war going on there. I don't really want to go there. You want to go there? He said, yeah, yes, sir, I want to go there. Okay. So you know, he was gung-ho. So I sent him over there. Track down this witness and find out what he saw. So he finds a witness, and, and, and he says, well, I just want to ask you, you know, about this event. And he said, whoa, 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 hold on. Before, you, before we get started here, um, the government gave me $500. What are you going to give me? <laughs> And he's like, can you say that again? How much? Said, Thank you very much. Corrupt Afghan cop, say whatever he asked him to say. And we had other eyewitnesses who said he didn't see it. The case fell apart. The, the prosecutor, Lieutenant Colonel Darrell Vandeveld, came to have serious doubts about the case. Then he dug up information that revealed that my teenage client had been tortured by the United States, uh, subjected to an intentional sleep deprivation regime known as the Frequent Flyer Program, that he'd also been badly treated at, at Bagram internment point in Afghanistan where he had been beaten, shackled, kicked down the stairs, held in stress positions like so many other detainees were there. He said, I cannot prosecute this case in good faith. Ethically, I cannot go forward with this case. He went to his boss. He said, we've got to dismiss these charges. I said, hell no. He said, well, can, how about a plea bargain? You know, he's already been there all this time. Nobody was killed. Let's just let him plead to, you know, some kind of attempt and give him time served, maybe a few months for rehabilitation, and then we'll let him go. Because the optional protocol for child soldiers, uh, or to the, the optional protocol to the child soldier treaty says that you must... Um, provide opportunities for rehabilitation and reintegration to society for child soldiers, that they are as much victims as they are perpetrators. And we had done nothing for him. We just locked him in a cell, basically solitary confinement for six years, what the US military likes to call single occupancy cell. <laughs> it's not solitary, a single occupancy cell. So you know, it's like a, an upgrade, right? It's your own private room. Um, how are we doing on time? Two minutes? OK. Well, including questions. Yeah, including questions. All right. I'll stick around, by the way, after if anybody has questions. I'm happy to answer them after. So that case fell apart. Good news, filed a habeas corpus petition. Muhammad Jawad was, that petition was granted. He was released. He was repatriated to Afghanistan. As far as I know, stayed out of trouble still alive and well and kicking. And, and Ali Hamza al-Balul said, you're not going to help me. You're American military. You're the enemy. If I weren't shackled to the floor, I would try to kill you. Nothing personal. <laughs> um, 
He said, I'm boycotting. I want you to boycott. I said, fine, I'll boycott. I got my hands full with the other case anyway. So we boycotted. He was convicted, got life. He wasn't facing death. He was, got the max, got life. Well, then they assigned him some appellate lawyers, and he refused to meet with them. But the rule said that they had to file an appeal unless they got a waiver from their client. And the client refused to meet with them, so they couldn't get a waiver, so they just filed an appeal. And the appeal, they said, these aren't war crimes. Material support, solicitation, conspiracy. And it went up to the DC Circuit, and they said, you know what, you're right. Material support, that's not a war crime. That can't be tried in a military commission. That's gone. Solicitation, that's not a war crime. That can't be tried either. Conspiracy, yeah, you know, we're not so sure about that one. We're going to remand that, and, and you've got to figure that one out. So that one is still hanging out there right now. Um, the US Supreme Court kind of split on that issue in Hamden v. Rumsfeld. There was a plurality that said conspiracy wasn't a war crime, but that one's up in the air. Um, now, a 30-second overview of the results of the military commission so far, because they have been a complete and utter disaster and a total failure, in my opinion. All, virtually all of the guilty pleas were to material support to terrorism. So David Hicks. He'd been in Australia, home for six, seven years. He filed an appeal. He said, hey, material support terrorism. I just learned that's not a war crime. Please vacate my conviction. Bam. It's out. Salim Hamdan. Hey, I was convicted of material support to terrorism, and that's not a war crime. Please vacate my conviction. Bam. It's gone. Um, there were two others other than Mohammed Jawad who were charged. And it turned out that their, all the evidence against them was the product of torture, completely false confessions. Those charges were dismissed. They were sent home. Fuad al-Rabia and Binyan Mohammed. So these cases, everything Guantanamo is infected and plagued by torture. Um, there were eight other people that were charged on the 2006 Military Commissions Act that the charges were dismissed. When President Obama came in, they've never been reinstated. They never will be reinstated. Currently, the plan is only to try the 9-11 folks, five of them, Al Nashiri for the coal bombing, and six other guys. There'll be a, a grand total, if everyone is convicted, a grand total of 17 convictions out of the 779 people that passed through Guantanamo. And that's assuming conspiracy holds up, because if that doesn't, can drop the number down a couple for, further. So, big waste of time, big waste of money. Um, all those theories were discredited about uh, you know, trying to enlarge the scope of, of the war crimes as have all failed. OK, if you have to go to class or for any other reason, please feel free to go. I won't be offended. If you want to stick around and ask questions, I'm. I'm here for you. For you. I'm here for you. Um, Professor Morris, that's my email. I'm more than happy to answer further questions that way.